So cervical medullary syndrome, which is a term that, again, most people probably haven't heard of, um, is really just a fancy name for the medulla, the brainstem being affected by disturbance in the cervical spine. So this would mainly be to do with compression, uh, compre like a brainstem compression due to pressure kind of going upward. It's sort of the opposite uh, concept to something like a Chiari malformation, which would be brainstem pressure from the brain herniating down into the spine. So instead it's due to the directly to the instability in the neck. So um, instability in the cervical spine, especially the upper cervical spine uh, and the ligaments that support the skull, like the alar ligaments. So insufficiency and instability of the, those areas when the weight of the head is heavy will cause compression, you know, like when you're upright, it will compress a little bit. You know, it's not something that can be seen. It's just something that will cause these symptoms of cervical medullary syndrome the longer that the person is upright. So it's very, it's a very debilitating and very imprisoning condition because it causes these symptoms and it's even, it can even be dangerous. So there, you know, it depends on how severe the, the problem is, the craniocervical instability. Like it depends on, you know, people with severe craniocervical instability can be totally bedridden um, and in danger, you know, in desperation of a surgery, which is hard to get, and I'll get to that, uh, you know, fundraising if they don't have the money because, you know, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars because there's only a few surgeons in the world who will help particularly if this problem is related to having Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. So people with various conditions can develop CCI, like even people with myalgic encephalitis, which is like severe chronic fatigue syndrome, can develop it. And people with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome are especially prone because Ehlers-Danlos syndrome causes weakened collagen, which is, you know, like I have, right? Which is your body's glue, so skin is soft and stretchy, joints are you know, more hypermobile and uh, unstable and loose. And, you know, injuries happen more easily just from like regular everyday movements, especially if they're sudden or quick or rushed, right? So people use bracing and tape and sometimes nothing like, honestly, a lot of braces bug me. But anyway, back to the cervical medullary syndrome. Cervical medullary syndrome is an effect of CCI. So craniocervical instability or just cervical instability. My diagnosis, which I was diagnosed with in Maryland by Dr. Fraser Henderson, who's like the, t the top, one of the top neurosurgeons. My diagnosis is cervical instability and atlantoaxial instability, causing cervical medullary syndrome with, being pro with prolonged periods of being upright, especially without any neck support or just mild neck support. Like I use mild neck support when I'm upright because the, the more, um, what do you call it, immobilizing collars they have their drawbacks. They're uncomfortable. They're painful. They dig into your jaw. They dig into your collarbone. They're hot and sweaty. Like I sleep in one for my safety. So that's the thing about sleeping with with CCI um, causes the most it can cause the most da one of the most dangerous symptoms of cervical medullary syndrome, and that is um, I, I'm actually looking at it right now um, reduced or loss of breathing. So cervical medullary syndrome can cause sleep apnea and can stop your breathing. So the symptoms of cervical medullary syndrome as listed are headache, and you can get a very severe headache, like migraine-like headache. The longer you're upright, the worse it is. Neck pain, well, obviously. Numbness and weakness in the arms, hands, and legs. I do get this, I get like neuropathy in my hands, in my arms, and in my feet, um, sometimes in my legs. Dysautonomia, so that's a deregulated, deregulated autonomic nervous system. So autonomic nervous system controls your digestion, controls your um, breathing, your heart rate. So that then we get to POTS, post-orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, which is a form of dysautonomia. I'm on beta blockers because thanks to the compression in my neck and perhaps other factors, which is kind of complicated, um, my heart rate goes too fast when I'm especially when I'm upright, when I stand upright. So I have to be on beta blockers because the heart rate going too fast all the time is A, uncomfortable, B, dangerous, and C, damaging. You know, it can damage your heart, right? You can end up in heart failure from 
the heart working too hard all the time. So to prevent that, I am on beta blockers, which slow my heart rate. I may not have to be on those if I had the proper surgery, but anyway, reduced or loss of breathing. That's what I just said. Um, so that's, that scares me. I have like, um, periods of time where I've, I've overdone myself and I've been upright for too long and I can feel the compression and the pain back here. And I start having reduced, like I can't get a full breath, like air hunger. So I go and lie down and sometimes I even have to just lie flat. But my body starts doing something interesting. I start constantly yawning. It's like being at a high, too high of an altitude and um, not being able to get enough air. And actually sometimes intracranial hypertension, which is what it's called when there's pressure in the brain stem and in the brain can cause uh, you know air hunger like that. Uh, there have been trials of um, altitude medication for people to who have it really severely and all the time. But I just have it when I push myself way too hard. Like after my modeling shoot, I was like in bed, you know, for a couple days and I had like the air hunger and it was really scary. The air hunger usually disappears after I properly rest for a bit and lay flat. But I'm like, I start yawning, which is interesting because when you go up on, when you're driving up on an overpass, you know, when you go on a mountain, a lot of people start yawning to try and get more oxygen. So I'm just like, you know, like really like yawning. And it's almost like a weird um, involuntary thing that happens to me. But it's, it's, it's probably my body trying to defend itself and get proper air, like, you know. So it's not a necessarily a bad thing. It's a good thing. And I do start to get, you know, the wider I yawn, like, like, you know, I get eventually get like a full breath, you know, it's kind of weird. I don't know if other people have that, but I do. Um, and problems with swallowing. I don't have that so much. Like I can take a handful of pills and just like swallow the whole thing. I don't know why, because I have this neck problem. So you'd think I'd have trouble with that, but I don't, I've never had, like, I have a kind of a talent for swallowing a lot of pills at once. So I, did though when I was in Vancouver celebrating my birthday and I was upright for a long time I started to kind of crash out and have head pressure and stuff and it was really frustrating because it was my birthday and I was trying to enjoy myself we were at a Brazilian barbecue and you know it was really you know fun like it's an awesome restaurant but anyway I started to have trouble swallowing big pieces of meat and stuff so Maybe, you know, I've never, I've never tried to eat before when I was crashing out other than that time. So I'm sure that if I were upright long enough and I'm having active cervical medullary syndrome attack due to being upright for a long time, that I would probably have trouble swallowing at that point. Cause I did that one time and I was just like, damn it, you know, enjoy. It was toward the end of the dinner, luckily, but it was frustrating cause I had to go back to the hotel and like lie flat and stuff. And then dizziness. So yeah, dizziness on, I get dizziness on the days kind of after I pushed myself and I'm flaring up and I'm crashed out and I'm exhausted. And I try to go down to the kitchen and make myself something and I'm like grabbing onto the counters because the floor is kind of like this and I'm, you know, my balance is off and stuff and it's pretty frustrating. So yeah, cervical medullary syndrome, sharing a bit about my experience with it. This is just something that, this is basically the reason why people who have craniocervical instability, you know, are disabled, are debilitated, are limited in their ability to live and to, in their activities in life, work, you know, enjoy, uh, partake in hobbies, you know, it's, it's just, it depends on the severity. Like if it's really mild, then people could still part-time, you know, partake in stuff like that, part-time live humanely. But other than that, once it gets to be more se moderate to severe, it's a pretty inhumane way to live. And there are solutions, but the solutions are often unattainable to most people, especially anyone who's financially limited. Uh, this condition is not like CCI, which causes cervical medullary syndrome, is not recognized. And I'll just say that I'll just mention that atlantoaxial instability, what I'm diagnosed with, is the instability of the C1, C2, the first two vertebrae. So I have to be really careful about turning my head. I can only turn my head about this much. If I looked behind me, 
um, I could, you know, have a stroke. If I shoulder checked, you know, that's why I cannot really drive because I can't shoulder check, you know, I, I can't look fully behind me because I, I, it's not safe. So yeah, because there is a vertebral artery right there and it could compress it. So that's no way to live and I'm sick of living like this. I just, you know, got offered a record contract from a, you know, smaller indie but very reputable label in the UK and they could get my music out on the radio and especially in Europe, eventually in North America. And it's really exciting. I'm really excited to work with them, but I'm frustrated about my lack of ability to perform and tour in this state. So, yeah, going back to the solutions, for severe cases of this, the solution is surgery because you can't go on living like this. It's disabling, it's debilitating, it's depressing. People who have, who have not been able to get help for this issue have, in Canada anyway, gone through with medically assisted death because they're so broken. Uh, they have sometimes committed suicide. Trigger warning, sorry about that. Um, but, or, or, and there's a couple of cases where people self-medicated, like drank themselves to death by accident, didn't wake up because, you know, we are in a pretty fragile state. If you're drunk, you're not, you know, paying attention to how much you're turning your head or how you're sleeping. If you pass it the wrong way, you can cut off your breathing. If you don't put your neck collar on, like I've gone through periods of depression where I've polished off a bottle of wine or whatever bottle of cider. And, you know, cause you know, this is hard living like this is hard. Okay. And my best friend had my back, you know, he made sure that he, you know, grab, grabbed me. He's a big guy, strong guy, lifted me up and put my neck collar on me, you know, for safety. So, you know, he's a good friend, right? Um, and I'm not, I'm not, uh, I don't touch any drinks now. I'm, I'm on medication <laughs> that is, you know, long acting opioids. So it'd be really dangerous for me to try to do that. And that's a good thing. It's a good thing. Um, it's very easy to slip into a depression when you're dealing with, you know, craniocervical instability in your neck that is untreated and you're constantly a prisoner of cervical medullary syndrome. So, you know, and on top of that, I have other problems because of EDS. I have a lot of GI problems, pancreas problems. I'm diabetic. I'm on medication for that. Um, and other, you know, I have other problems. So it's just, you know, that I could deal with. But this is frustrating. This is my biggest test in life. And I'm not the only one. We need more respect and help. People who are suffering from this, who are already depressed and debilitated, do not need to be called fakers and attention seekers and whatever when they're trying to speak out. This isn't a completely invisible disability condition. You know, it's completely invisible, but extremely debilitating. We're not lazy. We could hurt ourselves really badly if we like do things with our arms and scrub a pot and things. I do it anyway put my neck collar on and I do it. I get some help um, now that I'm, I've proven my disability and fought for it really hard. I get some subsidized help, but it's not like I don't do anything. I still do a lot. I have to make my food from scratch because I have a lot of dietary issues. I have mast cell activation problems with food. You know, like I can't have a lot of food. It bothers me. It makes me react. It makes me flare up. So I have to make a lot of things you know, from scratch with stuff that I tolerate. So that's hard because I have to use my arms. So I'm, I often just like put a soft collar on. I'm working on a collar design right now, actually, with those black collars that I use. They're like elastic bands and they sort of act like a second skin. They're pretty supportive, but, or not, you know, they're sorry, they're not pretty supportive. They're minimally supportive. Like they, they're okay. They help me kind of, they remind me and everything, but they're not, you know, supportive like a real neck collar. So I thought about layering them and adding a clear visor for under the chin. So I'm, I'm going to work on that design because I think that sounds pretty cool and it would still be kind of fashionable, but you know, minimalist and give some more support because the chin here, it's really the sort of more supportive medical neck collars always have the chin support here because the jaw and the chin, you know, they kind of hang down like this and that puts a lot of pressure on the upper cervical spine, especially when you, you know, lean forward to, you know, 
pick something up, to do laundry. Switching the laundry is a nightmare for me because my dryer, I mean, I'm blessed that I have a laundry system here now, thank God. I, when I moved, I invested in one um, secondhand, of course, but they're still working really well. Yeah, the laundry is like, you know, has, is up here and the dryer is down here and just the leaning, like the grabbing them and leaning forward to put them in is a nightmare for me. And I often get my sons, if they're around, to switch it for me. There's a, you know, Pearson, can you switch the laundry? Elliot, can you please switch the laundry? Because it's just a nightmare. So certain movements and, you know, everything like, so they, it contributes to getting another attack of cervical medullary syndrome. I don't always have cervical medullary syndrome, you know, actively attacking, but it's just the more that I'm upright, the more, so doing things I love, performing music, playing guitar, like doing anything, some things are worse than others, you know, some activities are more tr triggering to cervical medullary syndrome than others, but the point is that I'm a prisoner of CCI, of cr craniocervical instability. And I'm, I'm not alone. There are hundreds of thousands of people out there that are dealing with this and not getting the help they need because there's only a few surgeons in the world who are willing to deal with this. It, it is kind of a dangerous surgery. It's in, intricate. It's like the fusion of the upper cervical spine, sometimes even full neck fusion, depending on the severity of someone's case. Sometimes they have lower discs. Like I'm unstable technically from C1 to C6. But the surgeon that I spoke to in Poland, who's interested in helping with this condition um, and knows, you know, a fair bit about it, he thought that maybe just fusing the worst, the C1, C2, which is sort of the central area. And the others are kind of, you know, because I'm hypermobile, the others are kind of compressing around it because this area is unstable. So maybe just fusing that and then getting some th therapeutic injections like PRP, which takes your own blood platelets and reprocesses them and puts them back in your neck and stuff like that or prolotherapy another form of injection where it uses this kind of serum that firms you know makes the vertebra in the area more firm there's different you know non-surgical treatments for this for this issue and some people can get by with non-surgical treatments but remember all of this costs money and it's fairly expensive, surgery being the worst of it. You know, I've looked at other countries where the fee is a lot lower, and that's why I've looked at them, because I'm low income, I'm on disability, and I need to find something more attainable. Even if I raised money, it's hard to raise money, especially in a post-pandemic, you know, near, near recession economy, right? And, <laughs> It's really hard. And so far my GoFundMe is only not even a, like barely under a, a fifth of where it should be to get the treatment. Um, or maybe, yeah, it's just at a minimal, it's about, if I, I, I need, I need at least 30 K for the travel and staying there and the therapies and everything. So I could be at almost a third but I'm in the process of revamping it and stuff and changing the title to Rosie's Fight to be Upright um, because I went through a real depression earlier this year. I was on a different pain medication that wasn't working as well for me. And I was considering medically assisted death because I thought there's no way I can do what I love. And, you know, there's no way out. You know, I just want this pain to kind of end. And sadly, people do go through with that. People like me. But... Um, the newer, stronger pain medication and just pulling myself out of that because I didn't, at the core, really want to die, at least right now. Like I said in other videos, if it gets really bad and there's no solution or surgery doesn't work and, you know, I'm just, my quality of life is really poor and I still am not able to do what I feel I need to with my passions because I can't and there's no way out, kind of thing, there's nothing that's going to work, then maybe I would, will reconsider it. You know, I just want to see how this, these next few years go, if I can get the, some help in some form, either non-surgical or surgical. Um, my husband and I were looking into trying prolotherapy for me, but anyway, this is getting to be a really long video. It's 
kind of a discussion. I'd like to hear other people's experiences in the comments. That would be great. If you have CCI and get and suffer with cervical medullary syndrome, I'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear from you, people that are hopefully learning about this and educating themselves. Um, yeah, so again, people with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome are probably making up the largest amount of people that are suffering with this due to the fact that our connective tissues are weaker. So we're highly prone to develop this. We also have immune immunological problems. And another reason why people develop this is because of ligament damage due to unstable immune systems, you know, autoimmune infection. Those things can impact the ligaments in the upper cervical spine, in the cervical spine in general, in the spine, um, you know, because it the, these ligaments are affected by immunological processes that deteriorate them. So if we, you know, if the medical systems did a better job of treating those immunological problems instead of just neglecting them and leaving people to rot, and then eventually like throwing them drugs when it's almost too late, you know, like, like I take histamine blockers and, you know, stuff like that, steroids even, whatever, um, antibiotics for infection, you know, Lyme disease, Lyme disease can cause this problem with the neck. Have you ever heard of Lyme neck? Similar issue. So, you know, Lyme disease, myalgic encephalomyelitis, which has like a viral component to it. They're still researching it. All this kind of stuff can impact the ligaments. With Ehlers-Danlos patients, we have both the weak connective tissues that we're born with, and we also have immunological issues because we're slow to heal from infections. We often suffer with mast cell activation like I do, which is like, you know, too much histamine and allergy issues and you know, it's all, it all Im impacts the musculoskeletal system further, especially the spine and especially the cervical spine. So yeah, just to wrap it up here, um, there are lots of reasons why people develop CCI and therefore experience cervical medullary syndrome. Um, if the medical systems did a better job of actually validating people instead of calling them like fakers and crazy people and stuff until it's practically too late, which is a problem. It's a widespread problem. You know, people like me are medically, you know, experience medical gaslighting until we're almost half dead, you know, and it shouldn't be that way. It doesn't need to be that way. And society doesn't need to be contributing to it by calling us fakers and lazy and whatever, you know, like, uh, what it, this person on TikTok kept calling me everybody's favorite malingerer. And it just enraged me because I'm like, do you have any idea? I'm like, do you want to see my MRI? Do you want to see my, you know, genetic testing? Do you want to see, like, screw you. Like, you're just disgusting, ignorant, bigoted, able, ableist, bigoted person, right? These people, like, it shouldn't be tolerated, right? And I'll keep speaking out because we don't need this abuse. On top of what we're dealing with, living like this and on top of it getting abuse from people, you know, those people need to grow up and educate themselves and get a brain, you know, it's, it needs to stop. It's like racism and homophobia, except toward disabled people. Invisible disabilities are real. So many people have invisible disabilities. So many disabilities and illnesses are invisible and you cannot see them on the outside. It's not hard to just believe people when you see them talking about suffering. It's very rare for people to talk about this stuff and be faking it for attention. It's actually rare. You know, the Munchausen thing, the histrionic thing, like most people who talk about this stuff are indeed experiencing it. Most people don't want to be sick. No one wants to be inhibited from living. It's just like, why the hell would you want to be like that, right? So yeah, to actually wrap it up this time, Cervical medullary syndrome is extremely debilitating. It's something you, again, probably haven't heard about. It's very real. It, there needs to be more surgeons that are trained to help people like me, you know, safely, right? It's a very intricate surgery, but there is, there are, you know, ways to do it. Dr. Henderson has offered to train surgeons before and they've been unwilling, particularly in Canada. We have a major problem with it in Canada. And the UK also has a problem with it. And several other countries have a problem with accessibility to an, an adequate surgeon for this problem. Uh, you know, the treatments like prolotherapy and stuff, they should be covered. You know, they, they're very expensive. 
it's not it's not equal at all you know it is still categorized as a rare disease you know ehlers danlos is still a rare categorized as a rare disease but it's really not that rare it's just underdiagnosed as is this problem right you need an upright mri you need certain things that most medical systems don't provide in order to diagnose it properly i had to travel out to the us so yeah cci cervicomedullar syndrome is very real there are probably more people suffering it from it than we know and those who are diagnosed still are left kind of hanging in the balance not getting the help they need unless they have lots of money to get it those are that's all the truth we would love to hear your comments if you do suffer from this or if you know someone who does thanks <laughs>